Well, God, you are present with us, and we appreciate it. Uh, we have needs, and, and you know what, what they are. That's what you've promised, to hear our needs before we even articulate them. But it's important for us to say them. So uh, we want you to be with Peg and continue to be with Patty, uh, be with Lowell and, and Ally as she adjusts, and Melissa and Danny, and, and be with uh, uh, Elaine, my mother-in-law, and the family. In fact, be with all the families because uh, a, a, one ailment in, the, in, a, in a family affects everybody. So uh, just be with them all and uh, do what you've promised to do. You know, we're confident that you will, so uh, help us to, to trust you. And as we look at your word, help us to, to glean from it some truths that we can apply in our own lives. In the name of Christ, we pray. Amen. Mm-hmm. Now, I think we, I think we need to pray for Ron because you know what he said to me before I left. Uh-oh. What did Ron? Oh, yeah, he says to me, "Aren't you going to brush your hair? Because you're going to kill him when you get home." Yeah, I was going to. You know, he said to me, he's done that quite a bit lately, and I said to him first, I said, "Ron, it's curly. I can't really sit and do. Otherwise, I'll look like a bush." You know, yeah, okay, out. but he says, but he says to me, you know, because my, my, I'm losing my curls because my hair is getting thinner. But he said, don't you think you ought to brush your hair before you leave? Oh, I said, good. my hair looks fine, Ron. Wow. Oh, my goodness. Oh, man. Well, I can All right. That. Yeah. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put that on the list <laughs> right now. Yeah. <laughs> I came home with a lot less than I had when I went yesterday. Yeah, well, it looks good. And Ron, he, lots of times he'll say your hair looks good. He didn't say anything. He has ignored it, but at least he hasn't insulted it. <laughs> but I am losing my hair, mm-hmm. so I went shorter. She cut two inches off. Well, I could walk out of the house. Ron never told me, ever. <laughs> you have a smudge on your face, or you've got dirt on your face, or you've got mm-hmm. something. He never says it. Now all of a sudden, after these years of curly hair, he's telling me I need to brush my hair. <laughs> I, I, I think you need to have a come to Jesus talk. <laughs> yeah, I'm just gonna... <laughs> That's a, that sounds like a good come yeah. to Jesus <laughs> yeah. uh, conversation. And, I, and I, I've got to tell you, uh, I have absolutely no idea what it feels like to be losing your hair. Oh, it's, it's, it's hard. I hope you never lose yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I, I can imagine as I, as I think about it, it, it must be a real challenge to, to, to do that. Because, uh... Pastor, have we forgot Lori Myers? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. She's yeah. got, she's getting off right now. They found, Scott said on Sunday, that they had found uh, they is always they. Yeah. They uh-huh. they found a, a tumor mm-hmm. on her kidney, but it's not on her kidney. It's in her kidney, oh. uh, and so they're going to do surgery to remove it um, on Friday. Okay. So that's that's what they're going to do, and it she's had a. A tough time because you know she had a new knee, yeah. but that didn't go it well. Got infected, didn't it? Well, it did get infected and it it didn't go well. Now she get another one. She's supposed to because it's the same thing with Peg. You know they didn't take the worst one. You know I don't know why they but they took the one yeah. that wasn't the worst and cha- and and you know then it's hard to when you have a bad experience to say yeah I'm yeah, ready to go. True. Uh, let's do it again. Yeah, and this wasn't so. supposed to be near as bad as, you know, what, the way she had it done. As right, opposed to right. The yeah. way mine were done. Yeah, yeah. oh yeah, absolutely. This was supposed to be e- easy. Yeah. Well, and it would have been if the staple hadn't broken and she hadn't gotten infected, it would have been yeah. easier. Yeah. So, and hadn't been bitten by a tech. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so, uh, oh yes, but we definitely want to remember. Thank you, Alice, because, we, you know, and with Jordan, you, you know, how do you... How do you deal? That's, mm-hmm. That creates a difficult situation. So, and with Christmas, you know, mm-hmm. all of this oh, is like a perfect yeah. storm. Yeah. So, okay. Well, we're we're looking at Judges, and um, in when when Joshua dies, what's the situation with Israel? What what is the situation after Joshua is gone? What's the situation with Israel as we, we move into Judges? Oh, God. I can't remember. They are. 
Okay, that's going to be the problem they're going to face. They're worshiping God. Now, where are they worshiping idols? Where Where is Israel where, after Joshua dies? Well, the whole book of Joshua is about what? They're in the promised land. So the people have conquered the land. Joshua ends, the people are in the land. Yes. Are they alone in the land? No. No, they are not alone in the land. There are a lot of other people living in the land, right? Yes. And the book of the writer of uh, Judges tells us why there are a lot of people in the land. Because the book of Joshua seems to indicate that everybody's gone, but the writer of Judges says, well, they're not, everybody's not gone, but there's a reason. And what's the reason you still got people in the land? Because they allowed them, the Israelites didn't kill everybody. Well, they, that's, well, yes, that's true. But the writer says there's a reason. They refused to leave. Now, now think about, think about the general thingum that we see all the time in the Old Testament. You know, who's in charge? God's, in charge. God's, God's always in charge. charge. Yeah. So if there's people still in the land, they made a deal. God, God, wants, God, them. God wants them there. Uh, and and that's, we want to remember that. Because one of the things I do is I look at, you know, when I read it, I think of practical reasons. Well, you know, you couldn't expel them all. Or, no, they, they stayed to, you know, somehow serve. Or, yeah, they did practical reasons. Well, they aren't dealing with practical reasons. They're dealing with a the theological reason. So there are people in the land because God, God, God wants land. people in the land. You know, other people in the land. And, and why does he want these people in the land? Why does he want these other people who were there first, but they're going to call them foreigners, yeah. <laughs> even though they're there first, uh, why does he want them in the land? Uh, why, does, why would God want a foreign people in the land? Let's take a half step back. What, what are these foreign people doing that, that he really focuses on? Now, they're doing practically a lot of things, but the, the writer only cares about one thing that they're doing. They're serving, for, for They're serving idols. They're worshiping other yeah. gods, and and that's you know they doesn't talk about their economy. Doesn't you know they're worshiping other other gods. Now you got a bunch of people in the land that that was, that was given to Israel that are worshiping other god, gods. Why then would the God of Israel? Why would he not even want them, but cause them to be in the land to share the land with his people to, to get his people to turn them around so they don't worship idols? Well, you know, that would be excellent, but that's not the reason he gives. Uh -huh. That would be, to convert those people would make sense, but that's not the reason the writer of Judges says God has left these people in the land. What would uh -huh. be the other? What would, that would be a good assumption to make. What would be sort of on the other end? To test them. To test them. Yeah, you know, and that's what he said. Well, he's, he left the people in the land yeah, to test I mean. the people of Israel. Now, this barb, what you said, the people of the Israelites do what? Worship. Worship other gods, which means in this test God has given them, the Israelites fail. Fail, <laughs> fail, 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 fail. fail. And, and that's really the only thing that, that the, the writer is focusing on. Does it give other reasons? Israel is is supposed to now what has God made with Israel even at the end of at the end of Joshua but it's reinforced at the beginning of Judges what what is between and we'll talk about it a little bit today later what has God made with his people covenant. he made a covenant and a covenant always has two sides right one side gives one side gives what what's the covenant it's a contract so what's the covenant God has made with Israel them into the new land. Into okay. The, for, for, uh, yeah. God says, I'm going to give you this land. I'm going to be with you. I'm going to protect you. I'm going to be there. I'm going to help you. I'm going to be before you. You are going to be my people. What's on the other side? Obedience. I want you to be obedient. And that obedience seems to be, and you, you look at the law, and there's a lot of stuff in the law. I mean, geez, Louise, there's tons of little stuff in the law. The writer focuses on one area of obedience. And what's the one area of obedience that he focuses on? You gotta worship me. You know, that's that's the area. 
you know. Now, you're right, it's obedience, but in that big obedience, the writer zeroes in on, you got to worship God. And if, you, if you're worshiping other gods, you're not worshiping me. me. Okay, and it, so Israel, you said, fails the task, therefore they break the covenant, and since they break the covenant, what happens? They, they, God takes away his punishment. God, God, God punishes them. You know, he, he takes that away. And, and how does he punish Israel? And he always pu he punishes them the same way. Doesn't send famines. Doesn't send floods. Doesn't send, well, doesn't send fire from heaven. He punishes them the same way in Judges. Always the same way. Kills them? Well, yes, but how does he do that? He doesn't protect them. Yeah. From? Enemies. Enemies. Other people, right? So somebody comes and conquers them. And when somebody, and this is a pattern, so Israel breaks the covenant always by worshiping other gods. Always. God, covenant's broken. You know, therefore, the consequences, God isn't protecting them, other people conquer them. What does Israel immediately do when they're conquered? Ask God for help. Ask God for help. What does God do? Helps them. He helps them. And how does he help? He sends them a leader. He sends them a leader. And we've talked about some of the leaders that he's he sent. And and when you look at these leaders, and some of them have been big, you know, and then some are really minor. Yeah. Um, what what are some of the leader? Well, who are some of these leaders? Um, that's in now. Judges of Gideon. There's this. yeah. Okay, you got Gideon, and, and you got you got Deborah as a judge, and Ahud, yeah. and, and so you have all these these judges, and and what do they all have in common? They're supposed to be leaders. Okay, they're all of them leading the people, right? Okay, what, how are they unique? What makes them a little different? Because each of them is, is slightly different. Um, they have this? What's that? Are they judges? They're all judges. They're all judges. How are they slightly different? So they've got some things in common. And one of the things they have in common isn't necessarily that they are great spiritual people because it really doesn't talk about them being yeah. Overly religious, um, although God calls them and they respond to His call. Each one uses a different talent. Each each one of them kind of uses a different talent, uh, you know, because Ehud with the sword and you know, uh, each of them is, uses a different talent, and, and they have slightly different personalities. Because remember, we talked about Gideon, and what was the Gideon's deal? That was that was a long story. That was a lot on Gideon. What was what was his stuff deal? Um, he wasn't He wasn't strong, and he wasn't particularly faithful. Remember, he t tested God twice. You know, he had to. It wasn't just once. He asked for proof twice, and then when he was successful, you know, he kind of kind of went to his head a little bit. Yeah, I would say yeah, that he kind of went to his head. Uh, so, you know, Gideon is not a great, it's funny, I was, when I, I look at these things, and when I put these together online, and on a, I look for pictures for, for this passage, and I was, they always have some of the children's stuff, pictures, and, and I'm just amazed that some of them have Gideon being this really good looking, you know, strong, you know, break, and, and, you know, I think Gideon looked more like Peter Ustinov. Oh my. You know, the actor Peter yeah. Houston off, you know, yeah. kind of soft and squishy yeah. and, and fat a little bit weak. Well, uh, well, a little squishy. Uh, yeah, well, a little, a, little, a little squishy. Well, Peter Houston off. Peter Houston off. Give me a break. Peter Peter Houston off. Well, you know Peter Houston off? Yes. Oh, yeah, yeah. He was, near, he was narrow and, and what? He was a good actor, though. Oh, he was a great he was actor. Really good actor. Yeah, he was Hercule. Perot yeah, and some exactly. of those. But he was, yeah, he was. I like Perot. Yeah, oh, he was, he, he, was, he was good. Peter Ustinov was good. Look at, Google his picture later, yeah. you know. Uh, but anyway, um, so they have, they all have different, different uh, personalities. Okay, so we've looked at these judges and we've got this, this, this same pattern that repeats itself. Israel sends uh, 
A judge is sent, or Israel repents and promises. Judge is sent, frees the people, and the judge, everything is fine until the judge dies. And what happens when the judge dies? They do the exact same thing they did before. You know what I think she does with the water? I think she wants to play with it. Oh, really? Yeah, because she loves water bottles. Oh, she does? Yeah, that's well, a big, that's a, that quite one. a toy. <laughs> okay, now that's what we've looked at so far. Now, I think we, there's, a, there's a pattern with these judges. I think there's a little pattern with these judges. Uh, I think you've got the early judges. If you look at them and you look at Ehud and remember Deborah mm -hmm. is a judge. You, they they are, seem to be more heroic. You, you don't see flaws in their character. Uh, they, they don't talk about being particularly right, you know, the righteousness is an emphasis, although Deborah was a prophetess. They seem to be more together, you know, the kind of people you would follow as, as a judge. Then you have some transitional ones, and I think that a Gideon is maybe the best example. That Gideon's a judge and does great things, but Gideon as a person is, Not so. yeah, he's a little flawed. You know, he has some flaws. And so the, the quality of the judge is kind of slips a little bit. And then I think in the last phase, you've got some really tragic judges, at, at particularly the two major judges at the end. Both are pretty tragic figures. So not only are they flawed, you know, they're kind of sad um, in, in, a, in a tragic sense. And that's one of the ones we're going to look at uh, today. Uh, the first of the tragic judges, and then next week we'll look at one that is an absolute mess. He is a he is a mess. If you if you had a daughter, you wouldn't want your daughter dating this last judge because he's a mess. Uh, he's just a mess. So anyway, we're in chapter chapter ten, uh, chapter ten, verse six of chapter ten, and we remember we've got. Um, we, uh, uh, and Bimelech, his story, when he sets himself up as king, or he's king, and he, he's gone now. He's passed. So, and he may or may not be a judge, how you read it. Um, what's the situation in verse 6 of chapter 10? They, they misbehaved. Yeah, Jeez Louise, yeah, they did no even. surprise. Yeah. The, the people are misbehaving, which means they have Sin. Done what? Sin. Failed the test. Uh, yeah. Test is there, God's given the test. They have failed. And and what how have they now they failed before, right? When they've chased other gods. But I'm telling you, this failure is huge. Because what are they doing according to what the writer says in verse six? What are, are they, they are they chasing after a, a foreign god? They serve all the balls of them. Heck no. <laughs> they are chasing all, all of them. You know, so, and I think this is a little subtle way that, that the writer's telling us, and we'll see it even later in the story, that Israel is, is, is sliding. You know, the, yes. the, the stories are getting worse. They aren't getting better. You know, every time they, they fall, the fall is a little, little greater. And, and actually the judges aren't quite the same either. So they are, they are worshiping a lot of God, different gods. Of course, how does God respond? He's angry. Okay, he's, he's angry. And um, what, how does he show his anger? Duh. Uh, yeah, he lets them be conquered by other people. Now it's really interesting that he mentions the Philistines and the Ammonites because the Philistines are going to be important in the next story. The Ammonites are going to be important in this one. The Philistines are about as far west as you can get because they were right on the Mediterranean Sea. They were, you couldn't get further, you'd be in the water if you went any further west. East, the Ammonites are on the other side, east side of the Jordan. So we're talking about the two extremes in the land, which isn't a shock because we've talked about that before. These judges seem to be regional. You know, they seem to do their thing in, in one particular area. Uh, and even the enslavement seems to be kind of almost localized. 
Okay, so they are being just absolutely dumped on, right? And the focus is it is really on the east side, not so much the Philistines, we'll see that on the next story, but the Ammonites is on the east side of the Jordan and they're causing all kinds of problems, right? Yeah. Because they're oppressing the people and they're crossing the Jordan and attacking Judah and they're attacking Benjamin and they're attacking Ephraim and it is a bad scene for Israel. So of course, what does Israel do? Duh, Cry out. cries out to the Lord, right? And, and wonders, uh, uh, and, and they know, right, uh, what they've done. What, what do they end up saying to the Lord? They cry out to the Lord and they... They, they, <coughs> they have sinned against him. So they, they, end up, they end up confessing, right, mm -hmm. uh, to him. And how does, how does God respond? Well, against all those Egyptians and all of them, he said, go let those yeah. gods... Help yeah. Out. yeah, that's that. You. you know, that's right. I, you know, I I helped you. I helped you out. Now you're worshiping other gods. Ask them to help you. Now, and this is just a little aside. Uh, why would God? Why would God say this? Because they did it so many times. Okay, they they're doing it so many times, and every time they do it, though, they're they're actually doing the same thing. Yeah. What what are they doing? Every time they Worship chase after other gods, what are they doing? Sinning. Like they're they sinning, and why, why does that come? What's that? Forsaking the covenant. Yeah, they're forsaking the covenant. Now, just, and like I said, a covenant has two sides. As Christians, we want to be, want to be a little bit careful when we apply the idea of covenant. Because when we, this is a, this is a solid Old Testament idea of covenant. God expects this, and we'll do this. So we're in a contract. And if we don't fulfill our side, God doesn't fulfill his. And, and sometimes we get that and apply it to Christianity as though there's something we've got to do in order to get God to do mm -hmm. in response. And a lot of Christianity has sort of, and like a, for good reason, based on this Old Testament idea that God has like made a covenant through Jesus and we've got to, if we believe, God will, will do this. If we don't believe, God won't do this. You know, because they're seeing it as a covenant. We want to be real careful because the word covenant isn't used nearly as much in the Old, New Testament and generally when it's used, it's referring to the Old as the word promise. And a promise is different than a covenant. Because if I make a promise to you, I'm not fulfilling that promise because you've done something. Okay. I'm keeping that promise because I made it. I made it. Uh, and, and promise is the word that's used, generally used in the New Testament about God relating to us through Jesus Christ. And I think that's, that's really important to remember, uh, or just file away, because sometimes, like I said, we drift into this covenant idea that you know, this is me, this is God. I have to do this, and then God will do this, which is good covenantal ideas. When I do that, then it's up to me, which is really up to Israel here. You know, then it's up to me. That's, that's really not what's presented in the New Testament. You know, God is working with us. They describe, Paul describes it as a promise that's fulfilled, not a covenant that's maintained. And, and that's, I think that's really important uh, as we look at it because our, ultimately our relationship, and our relationship, our, how God views us is based on, on God and not us. It's based on promise, and promise is based on the integrity of the one who makes the promise and since God has integrity, that promise doesn't change. We don't change it by our actions. That would be covenantal. And, and I think there's a difference there. But we're not talking about promise here. We're talking about covenant. You know, <coughs> covenant. Okay, so this God, they've done that now. How does God, or how does Israel respond? So God said, look, you know, I made this deal with you. I fulfilled my end of it when you were fine. You know, when you're doing your, what you're supposed to, you've stopped doing what you're supposed to. Go ask the gods with whom you've made a covenant yes. now to help you. Because, you know, the deal between you and me is broken. Yeah. It, how does Israel respond? 
He, he said they confessed that they've sinned. Right. And um, got rid of the gods. Yeah, uh, but they, we're going to get rid of it for one God, um, and we're going to only worship you. That's you. The Lord. You. And uh, as every parent knows, every parent knows, as soon as a child says, when you say, why did you do that? You know, why did you do that? And he says, oh, I'm so sorry, I'll never do it again. As we all know, as I'm a parent myself, they never do it again. <laughs> right? <laughs> so yeah. when Israel says this, you know, we know they will never sin again and never chase after false God because they've made a promise. Uh, so, but what, how does God respond? Which I think even in this covenantal relationship shows part of God's character. How does he respond when Israel says, we're going to put away the foreign gods and we're going to worship you? How does God respond to that? <coughs> My Bible says that he could bear Israel's misery no longer. Yes. Okay. Couldn't take it. Couldn't, couldn't take it. And, but it wasn't that complaining. Uh, it was their <laughs> misery. misery. Which shows us e even in this Old Testament, which is often portrayed as so harsh. The old God of the Old Testament is just a nasty God. But this God of the Old Testament really didn't want to see his people suffer, even though his people were breaking the covenant, breaking the covenant even though they deserved to suffer. You know, it, it was their fault. Um, I'm going to use the basket to get it. <laughs> well, I wondered why you had the basket. Yeah, but that's, that's good. Okay, so, so God ends up feeling sorry for him. What is the situation in the land? So God is going to take care of them. What is the situation that Israel faces? In, in verse 17, what's the situation? The Amorites will be the head. Okay, the Amorites have got their army. Yeah. Israel has got its army. Yeah. And it's in Gilead, yeah. which is, do you know where Gilead is? Because we've run into it a couple of times yeah. before. Mm -hmm. Gilead is on the east side of the Jordan. So it's not in what we think of as promised land. It's on the east side. Mm -hmm. uh, they're in Gilead. Uh, and that's where Ammon is. Uh, the Ammonites are on that side. That's where their little area is. Uh, now, what is, what is Israel lacking? So they've got the army. The Ammonites have their army. The Israelites have their army. They need a leader who appears at the beginning of chapter 11. Jetha. Jetha. And how, what is Jetha's situation? He was a mighty warrior. Well, he was a mighty warrior. What's his background? His mother was a prostitute. His mother was a prostitute. And um, his, his daddy got married, right? Mm -hmm. And he, um, he had some other children. And how did his other children treat Jetha? They drove, they drove them away. They, they drove them away. Now, oh, and, and he fled. And, and the reason they used to kind of push him away was what? What was the reason? Why did they, why did they get rid of their half-brother? Because he was the son of another woman. Okay, so position, you know, son of a prostitute, you, you low position in society. His family pushes him out because he's sort of a half. He's not really one of them. Now that's going to be really important later in the story that Jephthah has this, and that's what makes him a tragic figure. You know, that he has this, this terrible family background, that his own family drives him out. And what happens to him after he goes out into uh, Tob? What does he do when he's he's out in the bush. They asked, the watch cult asked him to be their commander. Well, even before that, what ends up... What, with a bunch of strong people. Yeah, he ends up hanging out with a bad crowd, right? He goes and hangs out, and what do they become? Followers. What's that? Followers. Well, they become yeah, followers of him, but how do they earn a living? They were gangs. They must have stolen. Yeah, they were a gang. They were, they, were, they were bandits, and they went raiding... You know, went out raiding. They were a bunch of bad guys. You know, that's what they were. So in verse 4, 
The Ammonites, we're, we're back to the Ammonites, right? Mm -hmm. What do the elders of Gilead, which is in land that where the half-tribe of Manasseh and Reuben settled in Gad, settled, um, what do they do with the Ammonites in front of them? Okay, they go to Jethro and say, we want you to be the leader, okay? And what is his response? Ask him, didn't you hate me? Yeah, are you kidding me? Yeah. Right? Are you, you're joking, right? Yeah. Because? You kicked me out. You kicked me out. You know, so the writer is emphasizing what? That they didn't treat him well. That he didn't treat him well. And they didn't treat him well because he didn't fit into the family. Now, what do they say? So Jethro says, are you, you kidding me? Yeah. The way you treated me, I'm not thinking I'm going to be leading you anywhere. And what do they say? Make your ruler. What's that? Don't make them the ruler. Yeah, we'll, make you, we'll make you the ruler. We are more than happy to take you back. First thing. Um, now this is, so it's interesting. Then Jethro's been called to be, he's going to be the next judge. But what's a little different in his calling as a judge than we've seen before? When judges have been called before and found out they were going to be judges, how was it a little different than what happens here? How did Gideon find out he was going to be a judge? God, God told him, right? Yeah. These are people. Yeah, these are people, you know, approaching him to be the leader. In the other judges, we had God taking the initiative, uh, you know, calling. And even with the, with the minor ones, you know, that God made him judge. You know, God doesn't seem to be involved here in initiating it. And again, just file that away because it seems as though things are a little bit in decline in this story. It, we're not reaching high. It's not like it's it's not like this. The line isn't like this. It's more like this. You know, it's you're kind of going downhill and it's each time gets a little lower. Now what is the deal they make? Um, well they okay. if you fight Fight against them, then you'll be our leader. Okay, you're gonna you you, you, you are, yeah. yeah. And Jephthah yeah. says, "Yes, I'm gonna I'm gonna do, I'll do this." Now, what does he do as he approaches the Ammonites? What what does he do? Because he's gonna lead, and Israel's got its army. Or the uh, 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 Gileanites have their army, and the the Ammonites have their army. What does Jephthah do with respect to the Ammonites? He sends a messenger. He sends a messenger. And, and what does it then appear that he's doing with, his mess, with this messenger? What is, he, what is he trying to do? Because he's been described as a mighty warrior, and Israel wants him to, to lead them into battle. It sounds like he's trying to find a way around. Trying to find, yeah, he's trying to find a way. So what he's doing, he starts by negotiating. And, and we haven't seen people negotiate before. You know, leaders negotiate. And, and what is Jethro's position? What's his position in this as he's starting to negotiate with them? What, in other words, how does he approach them? If he wants to negotiate and avoid a war, because that sure seems to be what he's trying to do, so that nobody has to fight, what, what does he, how does he approach them? He asks for permission to go through the country? Well, yeah, well he says, you know, why are we, why are we fighting? Yeah. You know, what, what do you what, have against yeah, us? Yeah, what do you have against us? You know, why, why are we fighting? And, and the Ammonite king replies by saying, you stole our land. You, you, you took our land. And we will leave you alone if you do what? Give it back. Give it if back. you give it back. Peaceably. Yeah, if you give it back, you know, we're, we're cool. Now, 
how does that negotiation, there's a lot of detail stuff mm -hmm. as you go through it. As he negotiates, what does he remind the Ammonites? He said, Israel would not take the land of Moab or the land of the Ammonites. Okay, that, that, that Israel had, didn't really do what you're accusing us of doing. Yeah, they went to doing. the desert. Now, it's really interesting that we're looking at the, he doesn't appear to want to fight. That's not the first thing he wants to do. And in fact, when he starts talking about this, this land, that I, we really didn't take the land of the Ammonites or the Moabites. And if, if you remember this, I mean, give yourself, put a great big star on your Bible. Because if you remember this, this is good. It's really good. What makes the Ammonites and Moabites special? When compared to the Amorites and the Philistines and the Canaanites, what makes the Ammonites and the Moabites special that, that may explain a little bit why he's not ready to send the army and fight them? From their descendants? They are What's descendant, that? Dis okay, let's descendant think about descendants. What is the, what's the, um, the origin of the Ammonites and the Moabites? Something with Jesus in the Moabites. What's that? Something with Jesus in the Moabites. What? Somebody got a Moabite wife. What's that? Some one of them got a Moabite wife. Well, that's that. Well, Moses got a. Um, um, now, close. You're in the neighborhood. Uh, let's uh, a Midianite. Moses' wife was a Midianite. Uh, but we're, we're, we're moving, we're getting close. Now, Esau, he was the father of the Edomites. He becomes the father of the Edomites, which means we're uh, So, But we're getting close. Do you remember the story in Genesis about Lot and Sodom and Gomorrah? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. When, when Lot and his two daughters and wife leave Sodom, his wife makes a mistake. Yeah, she turns back. She turns course. back and turns into a pillow. Cell. And so uh, Lot and his two daughters end up in a cave. And his two daughters make an interesting assumption. What what do his two daughters assume? Decide to have a child? With them? Yeah, because there will be this is the end of the world, there's destruction, there'll be no more men. And so our only chance to have children is to have children by our father, by our father, by Lot. Oh no! And they get him drunk, yeah. and they do what they do, and they have two. Each one has a little baby. Mm -hmm. One of them's named Amon, and the other one is named Moab. Mm -hmm. And so it, it's the the descendants. Oh, this is how. The, the writer of Genesis, which is kind of a shot at the Moabites and the, you know, that their origin is less than noble. Yeah. It's a pretty nasty beginning. So uh, this is the, the beginning. Therefore, there's a relationship between Israel and the Moabites and the Ammonites that they don't have with the Philistines and the Amorites and the Canaanites. They are like distant cousins because they're related through Lot, which was related to, to Abraham. So uh, that might explain why you know, the, the story progresses the way it is. So they're sort of distant, distant kin. And he, and, and, but as you read, get to the end of this explanation to the Ammonite king, uh, the, what, what is his point? Because the Ammonite king said, you took land from us, you give the land back and we're fine. But if you don't, you got a problem. And uh, Jetha, through his messenger, says, wait a minute. Who is responsible for taking the land? It's not even the land of the Ammonites. It's the land of the... Amorites. Yeah, the Amorites, you know, which is even further north. You know, and who is responsible for taking that land? God is responsible. So again, same sort of thing God said earlier, you know, if you want to blame somebody, 
one, blame the Amorites because they wouldn't do what God wanted them to do. So it's kind of their fault. But God was the one that did it. It's not the fault of the Israelites. Israel didn't take the land yeah. from you. Instead, God gave it to us. And they asked permission to go. Yes, asked permission to go to through Moab and asked permission to go to Ammon. And when they said no, Israel respected them and didn't go through the land. Through land. You know, go through that land. Okay, so if and and he kind of makes an interesting at the end, kind of an interesting point in twenty four. And and what is the point he makes in twenty four? Because he says, look, the land we've got here that you blame us for taking, we didn't take it all. You know, God gave it to us because the Amorites were a big bunch of jerks. Uh, so we, you know, that's why we've got the land. He said that whatever the Lord or God has given them, they will hold on to. Yeah, yeah that's right. Because if your God gave you land, you know what? You'd want to keep it. You'd want to keep it. You know, if God, if your God gave you land, wouldn't you want to keep it? And that's the point he makes as he, be, as he is negotiating with the Ammonites. So it's really not Israel's fault that they have the land. If you want to blame somebody, blame God. Or blame your God for not giving you more land. You know, because it's not, but it's not Israel's fault. Now, what is the response of the king? Let the, let the Lord, the judge, decide. Okay, well, that's what, that's what the messenger from Jetheth says. Let, let God decide this. He paid you know, no attention. And the king of the Ammonites say, no, you know, he paid no attention. I, I, you, you, you're speaking in Portuguese. Yeah. I, I, I don't care what you're saying. Uh, all I care about is you are on land that we claim. Therefore, you either get off or we're going to... Put you off. We're going to get you off. Put you off. So what do we expect to happen now? War. We expect we expect war. And what happens in verse twenty nine that we had missed or that wasn't mentioned earlier? The spirit of the Lord. The spirit of the Lord him. comes on Jethro. So now he is truly a judge, judge because the spirit of the Lord is on him. And what does he do? What's the first thing he he does? Okay, he crosses over. <coughs> Uh, to the other side, east side of the Jordan, and uh, you know, I'm, the Ammonites are north of the Moabites. And what does Jethro do in verse thirty? He promises he God. He makes a promise to God, yeah. and it's 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 an interesting promise. What what is the promise he makes to God? And it is Wins, he'll give him the first thing that comes out of his house from me. The first thing that comes out of his house, he will offer to God, but not just offer to God. He will offer to God as a burnt offering. So we're talking about he will make a what, what kind of sacrifice? Burnt offering sacrifice. A human sacrifice. Oh. He's going to make it. The first person, the first thing out of the house is a human being. He's going to make a human sacrifice to God. Now, he's hoping it's the cat that used to drive him nuts. Yeah. When he was home. You know, that's what he's hoping. Uh, so, uh, well, maybe his wife. I don't know. But the, um, uh, he's, he's, he's maybe hoping that. But it's an impetuous promise. I mean, there's no, there's no reason here why he would make that promise. But he does. You know, in the sight of God. Okay. Now, if, if God gives him victory, he is going to... He's going to do that. Of course, what ends up happening? What's his daughter? Well, even before that. What, because remember, he ain't going to do it if he doesn't win. You know, like, was there any question that he was going to win, right? And why does he win? Because God gives it over, gives him over to the king. And that's something we see over and over again because it's not the strategy of the judges. Ultimately, it is... God. God. God is in control here. So the outcome is never, never, never in doubt. And Jessup is, is excited, right? Because the Ammonites have been subdued and the people of Israel are cheering and they're throwing my parade and ticker tape. There's stuff yeah. coming down from the buildings. And, you know, he's waving to the crowds and he gets home and he's ready and 
Who greets him? His daughter. His daughter. And, and the writer makes sure to make it as dramatic as possible. The tambourines. Well, yeah, she's got tambourines and she's got, uh, you know, castanets. And she's just doing her thing. Also, what about this daughter? It's his only child. So let's make it as dramatic as possible. His only child, this daughter, is the first one. And the writer even says, now, if you didn't get me the first time, he didn't have a son. This is it, right? Yeah. And she greets him. Now, what does this mean? He has to sacrifice her to God because that's to, what he promised. To fulfill his promise, he has got to sacrifice his daughter. His only, only daughter. Child. The apple of his, of his eye. When he saw her, how did he, what did he do? He tore his clothes in sorrow. He yes. tore his clothes in sorrow. You know, it's... It, these are really good writers. I mean, these are really good. Because this is a very dramatic scene. Mm -hmm. You know, he sees her and she's getting ready to party. She's so happy that her dad is there and he's won the victory. And he sees her and he tears his clothes in grief. Yeah. And what does he say? He can't, he has to do it because he made a vow to the Lord that he can't break. Yeah, I, I cannot. Uh, take back the vow I've made, and how does she respond? Do what, do what she promised, what he promised the Lord. Do to her what he promised the Lord. Because God, you made again a deal, right? Mm -hmm. Victory for the first thing out of the house, and is me. Therefore, do it. You have to do it. You, you have to do it. So. In fact, when you look at the two, she's the one that shows more faith, more faith than he does. Because what he, the promise he made was, what would be a good word to describe the promise he made? A vow. Well, he made a vow. What would be another good word that you might use to describe the promise Jephthah made to God? I have, I have one in mind, but I want to see if we're on the same page. A good word that would describe the promise. Frivolous, he didn't think. Frivolous, yeah, yeah, I didn't frivolous. certainly didn't think it through. Think yeah, it through. yeah, yeah. frivolous. That's a good one. That's yeah, a good word. Good. I was thinking stupid, <laughs> stupid promise, stupid. <laughs> Just a stupid. Uh, I mean, it really was it, it, well, yeah. frivolous, impetuous. I mean, there was no need you to know. make that promise. God, God didn't say, "No, you got to promise me something." Yeah. You know, this was something he just. Blurt it out, you know. And it's blurt going to be it a family out. member that comes out. Well, see, and normally. that becomes we've got something here that is both tragic and ironic, mm -hmm. and and I think it's intended, and that's why I think these these writers really these writers are really good. You know, it's it's tragic because whatever it was inside of Jephthah caused him to make that frivolous promise. Now he's God, now he's got to follow through on it. A promise he didn't have to make, but he made it anyway. So it is a tragic thing that it's going to be his daughter. It's also terribly ironic that he's killing his own, he's going to have to sacrifice his only daughter because he made a vow. his family was a mess. You know, he, he ended up being thrown out, became abandoned because he was rejected by his family and now he's in a position where he's going to have to do the <clears throat> ultimate rejection of his daughter, his only daughter, his only child, uh, by sacrificing her. So it, it is a, this is a horrible story. Now, what does she... That, does that mean we're not supposed to make promises to God? Well, I deals, think... Deals, maybe. I, I, think I, I think if you take that away, that may be a good, mm -hmm. you know, a, a, a good lesson mm -hmm. that maybe we shouldn't make impetuous promises by God. You know, there's a... Um, I, I don't know if you've ever read the book, or there was a way back in the I think in the seventies, there was a um, uh, a British series called I Claudius. Have you ever heard of I Claudius? There's, there were two books written by a guy named Robert Graves that was I, I Claudius and Claudius the God. Well, it was a series on on public rate uh, public television way back it goes in the seventies, and in it it's about the first four Roman emperors, 
And the third Roman emperor, he was a mess. Caliglia was a mess. And in the story, and this is based on history, it's not historical, but based on history, uh, Caliglia becomes very, very sick. I was going to say, he's very scary. Yeah, you know, Caliglia was terrible. Yeah. He, made, he thought he was a god, he made a horse a senator. He, he, was, just a, he was just a mess. Um, uh, his, that was his nickname. It was his, Caliglia meant little boots. That's what they called it, little boots. Because he was a little boy with his father who was a soldier. He wore little boots. So anyway, Caliglia um, is very, very sick, and, but he recovers. And his, the officer of the, his guard comes out, and the, the senators are all around, and um, waiting to hear news, because they expect him to die, be dead. Uh, but the, the officer comes out and says, a miracle has occurred. You know, Caliglia not only is alive, but has been transformed. And now he is a god. He has been transformed through this illness to be a god. And they all praise, you know, praise God, you know, all this stuff, the senators. And uh, so the officer goes up to one of these senators. And he says, I understood, I understand that you... No, no, I'm wrong. Officer and I say, then Caliglia comes out and he's wearing white. This looks very impressive. And everybody is, oh, this is a wonderful, wonderful thing. And he goes up to one of the senators and he says, I understand. You prayed for me. You prayed that I would get better. And he says, yes, the senator says, yes, Caesar, prayed that you, that you would recover. And he says, but your prayers were special, were really, really special. He said, you pray it. You offered the God your life to save mine. And the senator says, yes, yes, I, that's, that was my prayer. And Caliglia looks at him and says, then what are you going to do about it? <laughs> because it doesn't seem right that we both be alive. And so he sends... And the senator said, what, what do you mean? He says, well, you, you promised your life in exchange for mine. And the God answered, the God's answered your prayers. Here I am. So what are you going to do about it? And a soldier leads him away <laughs> to make sure he fulfills promise. his promise. Oh my. He fulfills his promise. Uh, and, and that's what same sort of thing we see here. And I think, Alice, I think, you're, I think that's, you nailed it. That we, as even with God, as maybe especially with God, because sometimes I think we, I know looking at myself, sometimes I'm a little fa more fast and loose with promises I make to God than promises I make to, my, to Debbie. Because you know what with Debbie? She's going to make me fulfill my promise. If I say we're going to go somewhere, you better believe. I better have a good reason for not going, right? But then I can promise God all kinds of things. I can promise in my life, and I can promise in my heart, and I can promise in my hands. Man, I can promise in all kinds of stuff, because I know what? He probably isn't going to collect anytime soon. And, and I think that's, this may be, we may want to be real careful. The promises we make we make with God. Uh, so I think that's a, I, I think that's a great, that's a great observation. Um, you know, just, yeah, just file that away. Sometimes you just, you know, it just comes out and you don't even think about it. It, it, it does. And, and it sounds, the thing is, it sounds so good. Yeah. Ooh, you know, I'm giving God my life. Well, one, what does it mean? And then how am I going to do it? Yeah. I don't think you want you to commit suicide. I, but I, I think it would be more like giving your life in service of God. Yeah, well, it's like Jesus said to the rich young man, you know. Yeah. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Eternal life, that's easy. I'll tell you exactly how to get eternal life. Tell me, tell me, tell me. Follow the law. I follow them. Tell me the secret sauce. Oh, that's easy. Sell everything you have. Give your money to the poor and follow me. And then you'll have everything. You'll have treasures in heaven. And the guy says... I can't do this. What? <laughs> what? I thought it was something more like promising, promising you my heart. I can do that. That's, I've always I've, I've said for years and years, the question of faith isn't are you going to give your life to Jesus or your heart to Jesus. That, we can do that all the time. That's easy. That's really easy. The question of faith is 
will you give guys your television? Yep. That's the question. Will you give I will you give God your cable? <laughs> you know, not not even your tel your cable. Uh, will you do that? You know, I haven't. I know I haven't done it because I got Xfinity at home. You know, so I haven't done that. You, you know, does that make me a bad person? I hope, maybe. I hope not, but I sure haven't given him. But I've given him my life many times. But my, not my TV. Well, I only watch religious stuff on television. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He's a good but I think, I think the point is, you got to be real. Let, you know, it doesn't hurt us to be careful. You know, because the more you make the grandiose promises, the easier they are to make. You know, and and you know, they don't mean laughing. well, or, or do, I, either laughing or doing this. <laughs> yeah. And and that's why that's why, and I've told you before, if on Judgment Day we're in line and you see me in front of you, I hope you got comfortable shoes and brought a lunch, because you're going to be there for a while. Because God's going to be telling me, you know, remember, you promised, you promised, you promised. Yeah. Yeah, and then, but I think what a Christian believes when he says that is that we trust that at the end God is going to say, but you know what? I love you. And Jesus Christ died for you. Can't believe you And that. so, come on, you stinker. <laughs> come on. I can't help but loving you. Okay, anyway, the, uh, the, the girl does, she, she makes a deed. She asks her father for something. For two weeks, for two, two months. months. Two, two months, months. Oh, okay. to hang out with my friends, friends and, and just be sad yeah, that great. my life is ending. Yes. And um, he says, okay. And of course, the writer says, now that explains why the people of Israel have four days where, you, you, you know this, the, the daughter of Jethro? little ceremony where women grieve for four days. Yeah. You know, you've been doing that since you were a child. But this is the basis for it. This is the reason. So, kind of links it there. Now, chapter 12, and we, we're just looking a little bit at 12. What happens? So, he, the daughter is gone. But notice we got a decline in the judges. The, the, this is a tragic story. This is not a judge that comes out triumphant. This is a judge who is severely wounded. Now, what happens, and it, it, it gets even a little worse. What happens in chapter 12, at the beginning of chapter 12? They, uh, they, um, the men of Ephraim called out That's their, right. their forces and crossed their way. <coughs> okay. The other now, they, they, Ephraim or Ephraim, yeah. is, they, they show up, right? And, and what, what is their problem? They want to know why they weren't called out why, to help. Yeah, why weren't we called to help you fight the Ammonites? Uh, now, have we seen this, the people of Ephraim do it before? Yeah, they did it with Gideon. Same thing. You know, why didn't you call us to help? And when Gideon says, well, you can, you know, you still have a role to play. You can collect the booty and that kind of stuff. This doesn't turn out that way. Um, how does Jetha respond to the Ephraimites who come in and say, why didn't you call us? We're going to burn down his house over his head? Well, even before, what does he say? What does <coughs> Jetha say to them when they say, why didn't you do this? Because you had called them when before. Called before yeah, you, when, you called, when we called you before, you didn't come. And so I, we, were, we were working with them. You wouldn't have come if we had called you. And they say, baloney, and what ends up happening? That's when they burned down his house? Yeah. You, you have what ends up occurring between the uh, people of Gilead, Jewish people of Gilead, and the Jewish people of Ephraim. What ends up happening? They end up fighting. Now, this is really, really important because this is the first time we've seen what? In, in fighting. In fighting within Israel itself. So we've got one group in Israel, part of Israel, fighting another part in Israel, which again shows that as a people, what's happening to Israel? 
starting to fight among themselves a lot, yes. that's causing them to go down. Going down. They're going down uh, in decline. It also shows, may indicate, where is this story, from where is this story coming? Who's writing this story? And this is one of these little things you, 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 you look at and think about. Who's, who's probably writing this story about the people of Ephraim being really, because that's what they are, they're being a bunch of jerks, you know, in fighting the people of Gilead, um, and they end up losing. Who's probably writing this? Now, remember, I told you, what we, what we see later is Israel's going to be divided into two kingdoms. One a northern kingdom, one a southern kingdom. The northern kingdom is going to be called Israel. The southern kingdom is going to be called Judah. Okay, Jerusalem is going to be the capital of Judah. So Judah is going to be really important because the temple is going to be in Jerusalem. But Ephraim is the dominant tribe, would be the dominant tribe in the north. Often Israel is not called Israel, it's called Ephraim. Judah and Ephraim. The fact that Ephraim becomes, is portrayed in this story as a bunch of jerks that are just being obnoxious to the sincere people of Gilead who had freed Israel from the yoke of the Ammonites. Who's probably writing the story portraying Ephraim as a bunch of yahoos? Yeah, that's exactly right. Probably the writers from the South. You know, and that, that Ephraim is... is is less than noble. You, you said Ephraim is who? <coughs> Ephraim is going to be the dominant tribe in the north. Yeah, but who does Ephraim represent? Ephraim is Ephraim becomes the the antagonist in this. They're the troublemakers. Yeah, but it's it, it, you said Ephraim is it, something else, but they call it Ephraim. Israel. 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 Okay. Israel. Yeah, it, Israel is going to be ten tribes. Okay. Uh, but Ephraim is going to be the dominant. And, and a lot of times when you read the prophecy, it'll talk about Ephraim, but it refers to all of those okay, ten tribes. That's what, that's yeah. right. And they're going to be centered, they're going to build their own capital, because remember, Jerusalem is the capital of Judah, and, and the tribe of Judah. Judah and Benjamin are going to kind of be together. And, and Jerusalem is going to be the capital of Judah, and that's where they're going to build the temple to worship God. But when the kingdom divides, you, Israel can't worship God in a foreign country. So Israel's going to have to do what? They're going to have to build a capital city and they're going to have to build a temple, you know, to worship God. You don't want to have to go, you know, you don't want to have to go someplace else. You want to worship in country. And they're going to build a city that's going to serve as their capital and the name of the city will be Samaria. And that's why later in the New Testament, you know, it's that region is going to be called Samaria. Samaria. It's based on the name for the capital of what will be ancient Israel. And they're going to be conquered first. They're going to be taken, but the Assyrians are going to take them into captivity before Judah falls to the Babylonians. Okay, so th this, this is done. Ephraim has done that. They've learned that lesson. Jethus lives for, rules Israel for six years. He expires, he's buried in Gilead east of the east of the Jordan, and then he's followed by boom, 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 right? Three judges. Ibzan, Elon, and Abdon. And what makes those judges distinct? Right answer, nothing in particular. Uh, I was trying to think. <laughs> yeah. yeah, nothing in particular. Nothing they in particular. <laughs> yeah, they have a lot of kids and, and donkeys, uh, but uh, <laughs> nothing, nothing, uh, nothing in particular makes makes them special. In fact, and and I don't think this is an accident. And when you look at scripture, you can't assume I, this is just coincidence. As those three judges are portrayed or, or mentioned, and these are certainly minor ones, and we've seen now the minor judges. Um, what what is what's a little different here? That's that's a little different from the patterns we've seen before. And they don't rule very long. They don't rule very long. No mention of who's oppressing. No, no fighting. No fighting. No mention of victory. You know, they just are sort of 
there. Just sort of there. So even the description of these minor judges becomes less heroic. Because I think the writer wants us to feel as though everything in Israel is in decline, is in a state of decline. And it's going to, it's going to, that's going to be reflected in the last of the judges. And that's what we'll look at next time, Judges 13.1 through 16.31. And of course, the last of the That's judges, it, well, he's not the, the last judge, is probably Samuel. Samuel probably would be considered the last judge. And he, was, he wasn't bad. But this next one is going, to be a, is going to be a piece of work. And who is this, the next judge? Samson. Uh, who's going to make a bad dating decision. Yes, yeah, uh, 13 1 through 16 31. Yes, he's going to he's going to fall in with a, a bad woman. <laughs> okay. <No. laughs> because it's going to be Samson and Delilah. Delilah. Isn't it something how certain parts in the Bible grab your interest, and that's the one thing you can remember if you don't remember anything else? Just certain <laughs> certain people in the Bible, yeah. you know, really. Oh no. Yeah. yeah. You know, yeah. Abraham, Moses. Yes. Uh, Gideon, Samson, Victor Mature, you know, <laughs> different people in the Bible, yeah, yeah. you know, that you just remember. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Charlton Heston, yes. you know, those, those <laughs> biblical but figures. But I'll tell you what, though, some of those, even though the movies might not be strictly, strictly accurate, yes. it brings it to your mind, and, and you, you, with them doing what they're doing, it kind of gives you a mental picture yes. better. Yes. You know what I mean? The, and, and you know, I know what I'm talking about. I, no, I don't know and, yeah, and, and I'll tell you something. I think that's fine. You know, I think those things are fine. As long as when you approach it, you say... It's a movie. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's because yeah. when you look at, even in the New Testament, when you look at the story of Jesus, um, it, it's really pretty brief. You know, you yeah. can read the Gospel of Mark, Lord have mercy, in, in an hour, maybe? Uh, it's, it's not a lot there. And so to present a series, you, you've got to kind of add to it, you know, add to the story. And, and that's okay as long as you look at it and say, this is an interpretation that a writer has made, which may be yes. no worse than the interpretation a preacher makes on a Sunday morning. That, that's an interpretation as well. You know, but it's an interpretation. It is not word of God. It is, it is not the Word of God. The Word of God is that. That's the Word of God. So if you yep. want to hear the Word of God, that. You know, exactly. don't, don't watch the Ten Commandments. You know, that's, yeah. you're not going to... Uh, Edward G. Robinson was not in the Bible. You know, he just was. And Yule Brenner, neither was Yule Brenner. But Charlton Heston was. Okay, any, any, other, any other questions? Not that they were, yes, I haven't even asked for questions, so yeah. that's, 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 that's pretty good. All right, let's have a word of prayer. Lord God, thank you so much for giving us this time together. Um, and remind us that, that you, you were faithful to us, and that faith, faithful to us is grounded in, in a promise made through Jesus Christ. Uh, so help us to remember that. It's not based on a covenant who you've made with us, but rather on a promise you've made. And that's, that's wonderful. And with that in mind, Lord, help us to be careful before we make promises to you and to one another. Help us think through the consequences. Uh, and even if the promises sound good and, and may feel good and may actually help us in some ways, uh, make, make sure before we, we promise um, that we, we've thought through the consequences. Uh, help us to do that in the name of Christ. Amen. Amen.